Hello, everyone. You're listening to Financial Marketing Secrets with Genesis Gems, and I'm Jenny Pierce. Well, I'm very excited to be interviewing a gentleman that I have long admired and who's an all-round great guy, and that's Andrew Griffiths, the entrepreneurial futurist. That's a big word. How oh, are you, Andrew? I'm great, thank you. Jenny, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. All the better for speaking with you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have obviously been a fan of yours for a long time. I'm a bit of a serial stalker on your socials. <laughs> good, thank you. But um, I, I do enjoy what you do. So I think it would be really awesome if you could just maybe take, um, give us a couple of minutes, a, a little snapshot of how Andrew Griffiths arrived to where he is today. Mm, okay. It's, it's, all, it's always interesting doing the snapshot kind of thing is because life takes these twists and turns. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm a business owner. I have been you know, all of my life in one shape or another. So I bought my first business when I was 17 and uh, I bought a dive shop and I had no entrepreneurial role models. I've got no idea where that came from. I just kind of fell into it. But it was in the 80s and it was the time when, you know, you walked into a bank and said, I'm 17, going on 18. I've got no relatives, no security, no anything and walked out with a check um, for this business. So and and paid like twenty two percent interest. I might add for everyone who's complaining about interest rates at the moment, uh, higher than credit card rates um, on that. And uh, so I bought a business with no idea of what I was doing. So I I, I made the, the typical pile of you know small business mis mistakes. I knew how to dive, so I figured I knew how to how to run a dive shop. Um, and of course, through through the through a roller coaster ride, I finally made it work. Um, and, uh, and, and that was my kind of early entrepreneurial experience, but what really shifted for me was I was actually working for a Japanese company, um, and quite a few years later, and I'd done all kinds of things. I'd taught survival in the bush and worked in all different kinds of things, um, up until then. So as many of us do that, that range of careers, but I was working as a commercial diver, uh, around 1990. And uh, for this very, very big Japanese shipping company, putting in pontoons on the reef for tourism operators. And I got decompression sickness. Ooh. And uh, and it meant I couldn't dive anymore. I had a very bad dose of decompression sickness. And so the company I was working for said, well, okay, you've got a big mouth. We'll put you into sales and marketing. And I ended up in sales and marketing. And it took me a little while to get into it, but but it was incredible. Next thing I'm their international sales manager, and I spent five years traveling the world, uh, learning about marketing and sales and, and presenting all over the place about come to Australia, come to the Great Barrier Reef. After five years of doing that, I started my own marketing company, which is targeting small business owners, which I loved. And, uh, and I started to notice, Jenny, that I was having the same questions getting asked day in, day out. So I had this idea, maybe I'll write a book. <laughs> so I, I wrote a book and this is a very short version it got picked up by one of the best publishers in australia alan and umwin and uh and i wrote 101 ways to market your business and uh and i'd like to say looking back at it now it is so funny like my my section on the internet is very very comprehensive it's the internet is coming it will be good <laughs> and I, I you know i think i was like i think i was ahead of my time you know with with that um, so I, so I wrote that book. I was very lucky. It, it, it was very successful. The publisher said, Hey, do you want to write another one? I went, sure. So I just kept writing books till now. You said I've got 14 books, um, with Alan and Unwin, Simon and Schuster and self-published as well, sold in 65 countries around the world, translated to almost 20 languages now. So, um, yeah, it was, it's a bit, the last 25 years have been extraordinary in what the books have done for me. So I tell you what, if you're good at something, then you just keep doing it. And that's what you've done. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and like most things, you know, it's funny. You write a book, often they say, you write a book, it's about things, you, you, it's stuff you need to learn or stuff you need to solidify. And in writing a book, so I've written books about customer service, advertising, empathy, now charge what you're worth, um, you know, all, all different types of topics. But it's very good because actually, even the marketing book, like I'm giving marketing advice all day long to these kind of businesses, but it made me solidify my thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's something kind of wholesome about that, that you go, okay, so what do I really think about marketing? What do I really think you need to do? And I wrote really simple books that were you know, designed to be practical and hands-on. 
but you know, like anything, you, marketing is complicated. To yeah. take something that's complicated and make it simple is actually kind of hard. So it really helped me to get clear on my strategies, my thinking, my beliefs, my um, all of that kind of stuff in writing a book. So it's a little bit self-help for me is what I'm trying to say <laughs> in, in writing books. I feel like, um, you know, as I said, have, being an avid um, supporter of your work and an avid follower of you, um, I feel like the thing that, in, and particularly during COVID, that you were very good at doing was communicating messages simply, it, you know, easy for us to digest, um, but also you were able to unite people. And I think, I feel like that was that's what your books do. And, and, mm-hmm. and in fact, all of your work does this you know I've seen you obviously do keynotes of uh and different things and 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 you know there's this united feeling when you come out of it because you look at each other and everybody around you and you go oh we're not alone (laughs) you know there's other people Mm, and this guy's been through it just as much as we're going through it so I feel like that's something that you um innately do that I'm not sure whether you realize you do it but you definitely and that's a lovely compliment for that because um, and thank you. I, 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 you know, it, you know what it's like. We we do our stuff. We don't know necessarily how others perceive us. Yes. Um, on that, uh, that is always, I guess, part of my intention. Um, I, I know how hard it is to to be successful in business, and and how complicated it is, and it's more complicated than ever. Mm. Um, and and the thing that I guess one of my big messages is. You know, I have this line, I help people of substance to build business as a substance. Mm. And, and, and in the world at the moment, it, there's so much stuff around it. Do this and you build a business in three days, turning over seven figures and, you know, and build the funnel and do all this. I, I kind of get that that's the way that people do business a bit these days. But there's a lot of false expectations. There's a lot of people don't understand the reality of doing business. I mean, I just did a video the other day that I'm about to launch, which is about you know, to be a small business owner and be successful, you've got to get comfortable with uncertainty. Mm. We, we have no certainty in, in mm. small business. If you can't deal with uncertainty, you know, or a lack of certainty, then, you know, maybe small business is not for you because, mm. you know, I've learned to turn uncertainty into excitement. Going, yes. I never know what email I'm going to get tomorrow. I never know <laughs> what's going to happen. But, but you know, there's no guarantee of a pay packet at the end of the week. There's, there's no right. there's no guarantee that your business will be around in a year. We can do things to encourage that, you know, and support it. But, you know, that's a big task. So I, I think that I have a lot of empathy for small business owners because I've been through the ups and downs and the roller coaster ride. And I've been working to try and build my ultimate business, which is kind of what I've got now. But it's also one that's that's going to be able to ride out those waves. Because mm. you know, that's, that's a challenge. We saw it during COVID. So many businesses... Mm disappeared the first week and you go they got no resilience they got no financial resilience no no and then we saw the others that went from <laughs> from making gin to making hand sanitizer yeah. and you went how awesome that is the epitome of small business entrepreneurialism i you know? love it like, i love you know? it yeah so so there's a fascination it doesn't matter I, I know it's also interesting, Jenny. I used to think back then marketing was complicated. Running a marketing company 25 years ago, like where are you going to market? The newspaper, the radio, TV, a billboard, and probably a letterbox drop. Yep. Uh, if you went crazy, direct, the, you direct know, radio, I guess, you know, you might put a sign on a bus, but there were like, like 10, 10 areas. Now I look at marketing and go, there's a thousand. I know, uh, I know. So and- it, and honestly, you know, you you do, you you just, it's like, you know, this view is like, I'll just cast my net out and hope I get, yeah. you know, and you just sort of go, oh, you know, let's just dial it all back a little bit, you know, and let's actually get target specific, which kind of leads me to our topic of conversation and where I really want to head with our discussion today. And that's to do a deeper dive around your newest book um, mm-hmm. or your most recent book. It's not necessarily brand new, but it's definitely um, the newest of your collection. And that is the best name for a book that I can ever think of, which is someone has to be the most expensive. Why not make it you? Mm-hmm. And I think that, I mean, you probably went against the publisher's uh, wishes in making it the longest title for a book ever. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I think about it and, and it's like, it's a, there's no room for anything else on the cover except the no. title you know no like, graphics required i know i know it's just it's all words yeah yeah yeah. exactly 
So I'm, I'm obviously, you know, I, as a business myself, I specialize in financial services and work with, you know, amazing people in the financial services sector. And so I'd like to, you know, when, as we're talking, I'd like to sort of, you know, I will often try and look at Mm. how the, you know, this book and, and what you do specifically can help these people, because I think they all generally are keen for a, you know something new, something different, and and leveling up. Mm. So tell me a little bit about this book. You know, mm. I mean, I've obviously I haven't quite finished reading it, but I'm in the processes of it, and I'm already madly in love with it. And um, no one can quite see, but there are literally <laughs> that many post-it notes in this book. It's not funny, but tell no, me a little it. bit about you know what motivated you to write mm. this particular book. Well, it's really, it's really interesting, Jenny. I mean, I've, um, I, I've battled with a poverty mentality and a poverty m- mindset in business. I have one of those childhoods where, you know, I grew up as an orphan and, and had a lot of, um, you know, challenge in there with, you know, violence and all kinds of, all, all, all things that often come with that kind of um, upbringing. My parents left my sister and I when I was six months old and my, um, my sister was 18 months old. And so we lived in and out of various care and facilities and, and most of it was was pretty ugly um, and didn't work. So I had quite a you know quite a lot of issues around self worth, and because I carried those into business, and and so I, I couldn't have money conversations. I would give stuff away. I discount everything. The guy I bought my business off, he had poverty mentality. You know, so 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 what I built was a, a business that was really set up to fail. Mm. You know, it, it was always it was never going to make any money. You know, simply because. I, I didn't have a self, a healthy um, self-worth kind of picture. And I, I often say I spent the first 17 years of my life being told that I had no value and the rest of my life proving otherwise uh, in, in all seriousness. Mm. But, but I noticed as I've gone through life and I've, you know, done work with hundreds of thousands of people and presented and all the kind of stuff that I've done, this concept of, of self-worth is an issue and it, and it does manifest in business. And I've seen many, many business owners that really struggle to charge what they're worth. And, and, and even though my book is about being the most expensive and being the best at what you do, being the cheapest is down here. It's a sliding scale, right? There's, mm-hmm. some, there's somewhere, it, it, even charging what you're worth. And in the last 10 years in particular, as competition has gone crazy because, you know, we're competing not now just with someone next door. Financial planners can be anywhere around Australia. You can, you know, we're all Zooming. We're all kind of being able to do that. Our competition has all of a sudden felt like it's got a whole lot bigger. Mm. And so what I've really noticed is, is that people's, for many people, their only strategy is price. And uh, and and if if I'm cheap, then I will you know, that's my strategy. And of course, my whole argument was it's not a strategy at all. You know, it, it's just, it's a it's disaster written all over it. But in that 10 year period, what I noticed was a lot more businesses undercharging, not charging what they're worth, particularly service based, particularly creatives, marketing, you know, web developers, whatever it might be. There's this, this inability to, to really charge what they're worth because of either limiting beliefs um, that they've got limiting conversations what other people are telling them you know or what they've learned from others and even things like the media kind of reading around and it got to the stage where I saw a lot of people in business and I use that generic kind of a lot of but I did see a lot of people surprising number who were just tired and fried working their bums off and Mm. really not making any money Mm. And, and looking at it going, why why are you doing this? And and their whole belief structure was what was holding them in place. And nothing was going to change. They're going to be working until they're 70 or 80 because they haven't really got a lot of super and they haven't really done this. A lot of business owners haven't been very good in that space. Mm. And then what they're going to turn around and go, like, we're, we're working ourselves to death. And, and I look at their numbers and go, you just don't charge enough. In fact, I would encounter businesses that would, even if they were fully booked, every hour available, they would not be making money. Yeah. You go, Do you realize that that you you can't make a profit at those kind of rates? Yeah. So, so, so this whole thing is out there about this this you know it's competitive. We've got to be cheap to get business, or or, or, or we you know if we put up our prices, we're going to lose our customers. So we haven't put our prices up for ten years, and that means you're losing money if you haven't put your prices up for more than two years. Yeah. You know, right at the moment. 
So it was a big complicated thing. And I started talking about it more and more as I was doing my speaking around the world. And it just resonated. I had so many people coming up to me saying, oh my God, that is exactly me. Working harder than I've ever worked, making less than I've ever um, earned. And, and I just feel stuck in this cycle. And that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. Because you know, I've experienced it. I get it. And I've had to work hard to break out of having that, you know, being the cheapest kind of mentality is my only strategy. Mm. And I see so many people and I just know the impact it has on their life, Jenny. I see these people killing themselves mm. in their business. And the worst part, they're freaking awesome at what they do. Yeah. They're amazing at what they do. But 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 they they don't charge what they're worth and and they just caught up in 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 this endless loop of madness. Yeah, I think a lot of that is driven by fear um, and the um, on mentality that the world has now. And you know, I think that you know if you look, you talk to the average small business owner, and you know, you, you, we similarly to you, you know, we I, I speak to so many of them, and and you know, even talking to other business, you know, people similar to myself and yourself, you know, the, the, all their clients are exhausted, you know, and I think it's just this, you know, oh, look, you know, it, it's almost you know their pricing structures are just, you know, they're they're not necessarily altered for many, many years and it, and it hasn't really progressed, which kind of leads me to a particular section in your book, which is um, uh, the world has changed to have you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I really think this is something that, um, you know, oh, look, obviously the last few years have seen, we've had technology change. We've had, the world has experienced a lot of change, you know, mm. over the last 20 years, particularly. Um, but, you know, the last few years has seen significant change for the way we do business, the way we as, as consumers respond to things, a lot has changed. Within the financial services sector in the last few years, between 2019 to 2022, you know, the number of financial ad- of advisors in Australia dropped from 26,500 to 16,600. Mm, so that's literally 10,000 advisors walked out of the room. And mm. that's a huge shift in the dynamic for Australian consumers, but also for the industry itself. It also went through huge changes from a professional standards point of view, from royal commissions, all the stuff that went through the mainstream media about advisors, banks, you know, it was just a lot of negativity, a lot of, um, you know, angst, you know, for the people that were also doing the right thing. Um, I guess where I'm leading with this is that, you know, we are seeing the rise of new, a new style of advice and we are seeing the mm. rise of alternative pricing structures. And it sort of made me think of a statement you use, um, you know, you, instead of change, you refer to considered evolution mm. in your book, which I actually thought was such a really important phrase because considered evolution sh- implies growth, whereas change just implies impact. Exactly. And I actually thought that was something that I'd love to explore a little bit with you. So can you explain sure. a little bit more about considered evolution and that whole piece around have you changed? Well, and, and exactly right for me too, Jenny. I, I look at change is, is us reacting to what's going on. Mm. And, and I think um, I'm a frustrated zoologist, you know, by trade. I've been attacked and beaten up and and chased by most types of animal on the planet, <laughs> from octopus to monkeys to to great white sharks to to all kinds of things. So so I have a deep fascination of the concept of evolution, and and, and I think that what we think of when in terms of evolution is we think that things change slowly over time. But what actually science will show is that things change rapidly over a short period of time in relationship to what is happening in the environment. So, and the whole thing being is, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a monkey, you know, and the, um, there's a forest fire and all of a sudden there's not as many types of food. The monkey has to adapt or, and to eat a different type of food or die. So that happens in a few months, not in a thousand years or 2000 years, short time, the monkey either dies out or it evolves. But most importantly, it figures out how to eat different things that maybe are in abundance, but now it eats two types of foods. 
So it can eat that other one when it grows back as well as a new one. The idea of evolution is that we're better able to survive in the new environment. Mm. But you think about us in business now, we have to be able to survive in a new environment. Mm. Makers are 100% in that space. The world has changed. The consumers have changed. People have changed. The regulations, everything has changed. Mm. Considered evolution as human beings, we've got the opportunity to go, okay, well, let's think about this. This is what has changed. How do I then need to adapt and evolve accordingly to make mm. sure that I can survive? Yeah. And, and not only survive, but thrive in this new environment because that's all it means. And you're right. I mean, I know the financial planning and advisory kind of service industry reasonably well. I've spoken at MDRT and, you know, and, and I'm kind of au okay with it. But you're right. Who are the new, you know, millennial kind of advisors? Come, They're coaches. Mm. You know, I, I'm helping them write books. That are talking about, you know, like how to manage your money, how to do this kind of stuff. And, and and it's interesting. I hear them doing coaching calls, you know, and they're talking to their clients about, well, you can't spend a hundred bucks at the pub on a Friday night if you want to buy a house. Yeah. They're coaching, their accountability, <laughs> their, you know, their advice. Their and, and, and I guess that that's the key. Those of us that struggle the most, who are the ones who have been doing what we do for a long time, because adaption and evolution we've got all of our credibility we've got all of our experience but we still have to be adapting and evolving you mm. know uh, otherwise you know we become less relevant the other side of this is this is about us adapting and evolving and considered evolution but the other thing is that that consumers have changed yes. and, and, and and we've got to really be aware of that one of the biggest changes is we understand value a lot more because we've all bought crap We've all bought the cheapest. We've all stayed at the cheapest hotel. We've all, you know, we, we've all bought something online that was that and it's turned up and it's that. <laughs> yeah. we've, we've, all, we've all seen a McDonald's burger on TV or whatever and then we bought one and gone, but we're okay with it because it's cheap and we understand that it's never going to look like in the, you know, but we still buy it. So the world has changed. People have changed. And, and there's this wonderful, wonderful, not only interest but demand for all things new mm. and the world wants new and the world wants value and mm. what that means is that for us is that we're this great opportunity for new products new services new pricing models new marketing messages new 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 mm. and in fact, if we're not coming up with new we're old and that's yeah. the key. and 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 being in business for 50 years is actually not a big enough pitch anymore it's not you know, no, like, no. You know, in fact, it, it's not. It can work against you. It can. Right? It you can know, it, because it, exactly. you can come across as stuffy and stuck in your way. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you want to get, you know, your brain tumor operated on by the guy who's been doing it for 50 years or the lady who's just come out of, you know, um, you know, Harvard, who's, yeah. who's the top, you know, <laughs> neurosurgeon. Yeah. And, you know, millennials will say, I want the lady from Harvard. Baby boomers will say, I want the person who's been doing it for 50 years. You know, oh, so, I'm stuck in the middle. I want both. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Me, me, me too. But, but it's a positive thing because it means, though, to make changes. Like if you're thinking about it in a financial planning kind of thing where you go, well, okay, the world is open to change, but you can't put lipstick on a pig, you know, or <laughs> lipstick on a wombat. <laughs> is what I say. So if you're just trying to kind of put a little bit of lipstick on the wombat and, and say now it's something new, consumers are much smarter. People uh, are much more intelligent. You, you, if you're going to change, change. If you're going to uh, evolve, evolve. I'm you know? so super impressed with you, I have to say, because I finally heard the word wombat in this conversation. It was always going to happen. It was going to happen. It was it was going to end up in there at some stage. For those who don't know, I'm a I'm an avid fan and supporter of, of wombat sanctuaries around the country. It's why I moved to Tasmania. Um, <laughs> I just I was waiting and I was I'm like I'm going to set the timer on this. You did well. <laughs> okay, so I think everything that you said there is spectacular and totally agree with you know expectations versus intentions, all those sorts of things. What I want to talk now and and this sort of, you know, there's a chapter in this book that, you know, chapter 12, which I just like was like, oh, this, that's that moment. <laughs> um, and I want to talk about trust and value and, and how they align mm. um, with um, opening yourself up to being the most expensive, um, aka being your best. And, 
you know, obviously charging appropriately for what you do. Um, I want to talk about that first before I go into the chapter 12 bit. So mm. let's chat about what's your thoughts around that whole alignment of trust and value, which is I feel like the alignment bet- around considered evolution. Everyone's doing a risk analysis when they decide they're going to buy from us. You know, mm. that's going to a restaurant, going to a destination, staying at a hotel, buying a hamburger. We, we do a risk analysis internally that lets us kind of decide there's two restaurants side by side, which one will we go into? That one's full. We'll go into that one. Yes. Because all the other humans are in there. So it's safe, you know, on that spot. I, I had a friend of mine who used to run a crocodile farm in Cairns and, uh, and he had to get his staff to park at the front. Because if all the staff parked in the car park, no one would come in to the thing. Even if, though it was open at nine o'clock, people would pull into the car park and go, there's no one here. It feels kind of empty. And they would leave. The minute he parked 50 cars there that were his staff's car, it filled up at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the risk analysis that we do is no different to us, uh, you know, a financial planner, an accountant, a dentist or whatever it is. So value is a big, big word now. And, and, People are prepared to pay for value. And that's the growth market, those Mm -hmm. who are prepared to pay for value. There'll always be people that are going to buy the $2.50 bottle of milk, but there's a growing market for people who will buy the $5 organic or the Farmer Direct or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But value is a big word because we keep going naturally back to the product or service that we offer. Is this value for money? And ironically, it's probably the least of the of the measurement sticks in mm. many ways for value. You know, I look at value comes back to everything in our business, our trustworthiness, not saying that you're a crook, but do you return a call when you say you're going to return a call? Number one mm. complaint that I've had with mortgage brokers, speaking at mortgage broker events, did my own research. I, I got 90% of people said they never return the call when they say they're going to. Mm. I got on stage and just said, if you want to be the most successful mortgage broker in Australia, learn how to return a call on time. Yeah. Yeah, now, it sounds simple, but that trusted in how you act and how you deliver and behave, you know, things like your experience, you know, how long have you been doing stuff? Definitely measures, but also expertise. Mm. What specialist knowledge have you done or extra learning have you done? Mm. Um, your, you know, your, your energy, you know, like what, you know, what do you turn up like? Like if you're on a call with someone, if you're meeting with someone, if you're turning up, you know, d- d- like what do you bring to that are you fully present and engaged yeah i want to know that you're really hearing me that Mm. you're really there there's there's a whole pile i've got kind of 10 of those that i work through that all of those are about how others value us your existing clients you know how do they value you you Mm. know and when we understand that well that then also forms the backbone obviously of our marketing as well because if you're selling you know ducks ducks you know, what else are you going to market on? You've got your story and, and how others value you. And mm. I think we've got to really understand what is it that others see in us? How do others value what it is that we do? And 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 sometimes that's kind of hard, right? Yeah. You know, to get that out, you know, but we've got to have better conversations with our clients mm. and we've got to be able to understand, well, exactly as you did with me just before we got started, you know, you do this, I see you, you know, th- this is what you bring to the table, um, well, actually, I think it was after we'd started even. And, and I'd look at that and go, you've got to do a bit of self-reflection and understand where you actually add value, why people buy from you, but also where you don't actually offer value. And, mm. and you know, mm-hmm. if you want to be the best, charge the most, you got to offer, you got to, you know, ping, 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 you got to offer value in all 10 as yeah. well as the product and the service. Yeah. And and that's, that's not easy to do, um, but... But these days, you know, if you're down this end and all you're doing is price, you know, your business is the most vulnerable it's ever been because there's always mm-hmm. going to be someone who's going to be cheaper. So so we've got to kind of be going up the the costing kind of barrier. And the way to do that is to, is to really look at how we offer value and mm-hmm. redefine value, reinvent our relationship, understand. It's no good if you say, hey, we're the most energetic kind of advisors on the face of the planet and no one cares. You know, and if that's not what people want, they don't see value in that. Or, if, you know, um, but we value that as opposed to being trusted, for example. So, yeah. so this is a bit of a journey of self-reflection as well and I, and highlighting what our gaps are in the I value think, kind of measurement stick. I think the other thing too is that, you know, we are... Um, we do tend to like with like, you know, we are that attraction 
mentality, you know, that, you know, your own core values, your, your you know, what you trust and what you value is often Very reflected true. in um, the people that you want to work with and, 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 you know, which kind of segues into my favorite chapter so far, I'm going to say so far, disclaimer, um, it, which is chapter 12. And I mentioned this to you previously, just because, uh, you know, I speak so frequently to um, my clients and, and, you know, in presentations and different things, I talk so frequently about, you know, create, you know, the importance of creating and being aware of who your client uh, avatars are so that you are always attracting your ideal client. They are the people that you want to ideally work with. And, you know, chapter 12, there is a wonderful freedom when you accept that not everyone is your customer. Mm. I fell in love with that, that just the title of this chapter. <laughs> I just, I feel like understanding who your clients are is got to be one of the first things people should do when they step into a new business and also continually reflect on in an existing business. What's your thoughts? So it's a big question and it's a, it's a great one. I love that it's your favourite chapter, Jenny. Um, I think you're right. When you're starting your business, all, all the best intentions, you, you really don't know. You know, like like who you, you hope you might set it. You know, as you see, you might do the customer avatar. And look, this is who we're targeting. But there's always wild cards that come out, and all of a sudden you find, well, actually, you know, that left of centre group over there love what we do. Like, who, who would have figured it out? Um, I, I think the the freedom that comes from you know knowing when you're sitting across from someone and you know that they're your ideal customer your ideal clients yeah you know what when that person walks through the door i'd like this this and this this is what i'm coming to you because of this righty righty you go it's just a per they're easy sales and you deliver every time because it's your sweet spot the we also if you've been in business for more than a week you also know when you've taken on a client that you shouldn't <laughs> and, and you know the pain you know the angst you know, the unhappiness, you know, you know when it's going to end in tears before you've even, you know, signed them up. And and part of the problem is, is that we take those people on when we should, in fact, say no. Yes. And, and, but in the early days, you don't say no to anyone, right? Because mm. it's you've got to pay the rent. Even now, you know, you go into business, if, if you're taking on, like, let's say you're price driven and it's all about price. The problem is, that that you know, there's no loyalty in price-driven clients because they'll they'll only they'll stay with you as long as you're the cheapest, and they'll find mm. someone else. They'll attract their other price-driven friends and recommend them to your business. So you know, I, I've seen this where I've had the wrong kind of clients that I've managed to do a great job for, and then they rec which has been a nightmare. But then they go and tell their other friends who are exactly the same, and I end up with twenty of these terrible clients. Mm. And, and it's like wow. So, so when when you kind of go, okay, this really is my ideal client, and I'm okay with saying no, and I'm okay with losing clients. And when you start to put your pricing structure, when you start to increase your prices, you change your customer base. And the first thing that happens is you start to lose clients. And this is when people chicken out. Mm. So typically you come to me, I work with you, and we say, we're going to put up your prices. This is how we're going to go about doing it. The first thing is there's a downturn in, in customers. And that's when, again, people go, oh, my God, I've got to put my prices back down again. And I go, you've got to ride through that, and then you come back out the other side where all of a sudden you just attract those people who are prepared to pay for you for what it is that you do, your quality and your service. Now, I know that people could be listening to this and go, oh, that's that's very Pollyanna-ish. I've seen it. I've done it. I've helped businesses do it a hundred times. You know, mm -hmm. you change your client base and you only have your ideal customers, which is what I have in my business now. Mm -hmm. I don't have customers that are wrong. I don't mm -hmm. have clients that are wrong because I've consciously made the point of knowing and I listen to my intuition a lot more where I kind of go, Jen, look, you're lovely, but I don't think I'm the right person for you, you know, because of this, this and this, but I'm going to recommend you to someone else. Yeah. And, and and it's not because I've got millions of dollars in the bank, I don't need the clients or whatever it might be. It's just that I know that if I stick, stick to my ideal clients and, and I'm working with the right people, they'll refer their friends, colleagues, et cetera, who are like-minded. You know, so, so over the years, all of my referrals 
are the right clients. Mm. Within the early days, I'd get all these referrals and half of them are wrong people, you know, don't want to pay, problematic, yet I'm caught up in there. And my business is far more complicated than it should be and not really making any money, you mm. know. So, so there is a freedom that comes from charging what you're worth. Now, if you are the most expensive, don't, you know, don't get me wrong. If you're the most expensive, they're, they're often the most demanding of clients. But I love it when someone says, you know, Jenny referred you to us, Andrew. She said that you're the most expensive, but she said that you're the best. Yes. That's the line that I want to hear. Yeah. That's, that, that line to me says they're pre-qualified. They are my ideal clients. They are not coming to me because I'm the cheapest. They know that I'm the most expensive and they are prepared to pay for quality. And on top of that, you know, one of the biggest complaints I hear from people that undercharge, they say to me all the time, our customers don't respect us, don't appreciate or value the advice that we offer. Wow. They undervalue, you know, and it's like day in, day out, I, we do this amazing job and they don't appreciate and respect us. When you change your customer base, you all of a sudden are having conversations where every single call you're having people go, oh my God, thank you so much for your wisdom, for your advice, for your professionalism. You know, like they value what you do because yeah. they're paying accordingly. And there's yeah. this wonderful shift that starts to happen. I have to say, um, as I mentioned, I haven't quite finished the book yet, but I am up to chapter 33, which is it's the perfect time to be the best. <laughs> so you, you're like, you're, you were like, that's where I'm like, oh, okay. So what you were saying is quite true. I think, you know, that you, I think there's a lot of moving parts, as you say, that have you're to right. come together to, you know, to make the, the, you know, to step into the situation where yes, I can be the most expensive, but I also have to be the best if I'm going to be the most expensive and, and we can choose, I guess, our level at that. And, a and absolutely, you, you know, you because go uh, up that sliding scale, the sliding yeah. scale. And I think that's really important, but, you know, I feel like, you know, um, having owned, as I said, you know, many small businesses and, and this business, my business, Genesis has been, you know, around for quite a while now, <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm sort of looking at it going, it never hurts to pick up a book like this and just sit back, you know, for with, with some time, you need time to allow this to absorb, mm -hmm. you know, and I just feel like you've written this in language that, literally anyone can stand, but you've been so forthright in going, well, this is how, you know? And so Absolutely. I feel this like is how this you is, put your prices up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a fabulous, fabulous book. And I, I just, I cannot thank you enough for a for writing it, but B for, you know, sharing so much of you and your own stuff in this, because it's just a, a godsend for anyone, mm, whether you're you. a startup or whether you're, um, you know, a well-established business, this is a book that, you know, taking your time and reading will definitely be, be advantageous to you. But um, I have to just draw back because, as you know, I love marketing um, and it's in my DNA, but it's also in your DNA, which, it you is. know, obviously you have a, a you know, um, a, an absolute um, wonderful career in writing books. Um, and we understand that, you know, like 14 books in 20 years invert, you know, language, different languages and all sorts of things. But, you know, you have, you do have such a diverse offering, you know, coaching programs, you do your speakers training courses, you do your author academy. And I know that a number of financial advisors have gone through that, that, mm. um, that process with you. So tell me a little bit about like, you know, how do you keep your audience engaged? Do you know, mm. like, let's flip it for a moment here. You sure. know, I, I'm really keen to sort of go, well, what's, you know, what's your methodology in this stuff? It's, it's a, you know, again, another great question. I, I mean, for, for me, I've spent a long time building my Andrew Griffiths brand and, and I'm a branding guy, as you say, you know, I understand the value of marketing and, um, and I've built a global brand mm. and, and, and uh, you know, for me, a lot of the companies that I work for around the world, are you know, enormous, you know, like mm. the European union, I've done work for them throughout, throughout the UK, 
you know, the CBSs of the world, the Hewlett Packards of the world. Like I've worked with a lot of very, very big organizations at a global level, let alone in Australia, like the likes of Telstra and Opti, they're kind of small compared <laughs> to, to many of the companies I've worked at. And, and, and I've worked for in advisory kind of roles of, of presenting and running workshops and all that kind of stuff. So I've had to build a brand that, that would allow me to have a global presence. Now, I, it's me. That's my business. I don't have a team of people. I don't have 100, you know, VAs offshore. I literally have myself and my partner helps me with some of my marketing side of things there. But I invest heavily in brand. And if you go to my website, you'll see mm. uh, my branding is very, very strong. But I'm also doing the same thing that we started this conversation off with is, is this considered you know, considered evolution, because I know that I have to be constantly adapting and evolving and building my community, you know, offering value, acting with the utmost of integrity, professionally, you know, doing all of those kind of things, because, uh, because, you know, that's what, you know, makes people trust me. That's, that's how I offer value is the energetics, the, the experience, the, the expertise, the credibility, my, energy how i turn up my mm -hmm. my presence my sense of humor whatever it might be so i've really focused on building my brand and adapting and evolving and all i really do though jenny is i teach people to do what i do i, yeah. I, I teach people what i figured out and, and yeah. i never say that i've got all the answers you know I, that for me I, I i kind of there's too many other people out there that say they've got all the answers but what i do say is that i figured some stuff out it works really well for me and this is how I've done it. Mm. And, and I share a lot of that stuff very openly, freely. Um, I, I have other stuff that, that people buy and, you know, work with me. But I, my brand and my offering is constantly adapting and evolving. And mm. it's the old Alvin Toffler quote, you know, the, you know, the illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who can't read or write, but those who can't learn, unlearn and relearn. Mm. That, 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 you know, we, we, it's a great quote. So I'm, you know, I've got to make sure that I'm staying out front and adapting and evolving because I think when you get a little bit older in business as well, if you're not careful, you, you do get left behind and, and it's a big issue. And I see that in many businesses where the average age is about 50, you know, you, you kind of go, hey, you, adaption and evolution and I've had many arguments with financial planners about using social media over the years. Mm. You know, and, and I turn around and go, if you're not adapting and evolving, then you're, you know, you get left behind. Mm. And, and you've got to embrace, you know, my brain is constantly adapting and evolving. One of the big things I think in business that we're all kind of um, facing and often we don't even realize it is the battle for relevance. Oh, and, we, we, we can lose relevance in a heartbeat now, yeah. not for doing anything wrong, but simply because something else comes along. Like let's say you're a copywriter right at the moment. You'd be kind of looking out the window going, okay, this is not good. There's a lot of stuff changing. You go, oh, but copywriters are this and that and all the rest of it. To the average person, Chat GPT can write an article of a thousand words in seven seconds. Now I know all of the pluses and minuses of that, but you would be foolish to think that there wasn't a concern on the horizons. Mm. So, so, and I'm seeing so many industries where technology is going, well, you know, what do we do now? I spoke at some surveyors conferences recently and they're going, it's all done with drones and GPS now. What do we need to go out in the field for? Will there be surveyors in, in 10 years, 20 years? All of this stuff is, is up there. We have to be going, well, how do I stay relevant? Everyone listening, watching this, you're in a battle for relevance. Yeah. And, and you need to accept that you're in the battle. You need to have a strategy for saying, how am I going to consciously and considered way evolve to make sure that I'm staying relevant with my customers? And that means we've got to have this really tight connection. So I don't create any product or service, Jenny, without going out to my community and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this or Ask him directly, what do you need me to be creating to help you in your business right yeah. now? You, and you've got to have me. a feedback loop. You've got to. They, yeah. and, and if I get 40 or 50 people say, oh, my God, I need this, that would be amazing, then I start work. Whereas we do it the other way around now. People are still making stuff. They're going out and trying to find someone to buy it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, it's a yeah. waste of time. You yeah. Know, have a community, build a community, solve problems. And I know it sounds a bit like a cliche, but serve. Yeah. Serve people serve people and come from that place in the, of intent and people will know that and see that level of integrity 
you know. And everyone thinks my new book is all about money. It, 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 it's not about money. It's about self-respect. It's about self-worth. It's about future-proofing your business. It's about making your business more enjoyable. It's about working with those people that value, respect, and appreciate you. That's what it's a book about. It's yes. not about dollars in the bank. That's just a lovely buy product. Yeah. And that's what I like about it the most. And that's why I, you know, that's why I'm such an advocate of this as an idea. It really has allowed me like the, this ethos is flowing through, you know, mm. and this sense of purpose is flowing through. And I'm like going, hmm, okay, how well is my business aligned with all of that? And is it, you know, is it not only serving the people that I want to work with, but is it serving me, you know? Mm. And I think that's, you know, that's that self-respect thing coming back going, well, you know, am I doing what I'm meant to be doing, you know? So I feel like even though it's a book about business, it's actually a book about people. Um, absolutely and it absolutely is yeah you know? and I, I just look as it, it's just I have to just drag this comment back you when you know we're sort of talking about you know obviously we have a maturing population we have got a lot of older advisors in the industry you know although we are fortunately starting to see more uh, young market entrants um, forming a career path in advice but, you know, I, I was I read, I read a blog article just recently. I think it might have been yesterday, the day before. And it was, you know, and it was actually titled Elder, Not Elderly. And I thought I really made nice. me sit back and go, you know what, um, just because I've been in business 20, 30 years, whatever it is, doesn't mean that I, am, I don't have anything to offer, that my relevance has exactly. disappeared. Exactly. And this book actually helps you with that. You know, it actually helps you sit back and go, hmm, okay, if I work on all these elements and as you say, that sliding scale, you know, where I'm not cheap, that I'm not the cheapest and I may not necessarily be the most expensive, but I might find my place along that sliding scale. But within that, I, I've lifted all these other things, then I'm, I'm now the elder, not the elderly in what I do, because you've still got a lot to offer. You still resonate and you still have relevance. The, and the wisdom that you've learned. There's, there's a great yes. book by Arthur, uh, Arthur Brooks, and it's like second season uh, of life. And it's not make the le- second half of your life the best part of your life. That's a, you know, we've all kind of heard that. Um, this is a really great book. Um, Arthur C. Brooks, um, second season is the, is the name of it. I think again, something like that, you'll find it. Um, but it talks about you can't just keep trying to build your business based or, or build your career on what you did. Everyone peaks. And after we've peaked, we have to start appreciating the different things that we bring to the table. Mm. And that's where our real value lay. Mm. An example, Jenny, that I have in there is I get booked a lot as a speaker. And and what people say to me is, the re- we want you to do the opening keynote or the closing keynote. And the reason we want you to do it is because you're a, a safe booking. You know, we, we don't have to worry about you A, turning up or B, entertaining the audience or all that kind of stuff. You, you've got a bit of gray hair. You've been doing this for a long time. We know that you're going to deliver. So we book you. That's bang. We know that we're coming. Mm-hmm. Then we can take a bit of a risk on some of the newer speakers and different speakers coming around. And I that was really interesting for me because I hear that comment all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, our committee was thinking about, yeah, we, we, we need to get you because our audience needs needs some wisdom. You know, they, they, they need wisdom. And it's interesting because before I would always be thinking cutting edge and this and that and the other, whereas now I know I'm an elder in the speaking space. And what I bring to the table is experience and wisdom and passion and conviction and and that sense of oh, this is what your journey will be. I've done that journey. I can help you by that learning. There's mm. always a role for someone who's going to get up and talk about chat GPT and how to use that and do this and today's latest thing. But second season people, those of us a little bit older, you know, now I know that my wisdom is of value to others. Mm. Now I know that my experience is of value. Now I know my um, my maturity. Mm. I don't need to impress people on the stage anymore. I don't care about impressing people on the stage. What I care about is helping the people yeah. in front of me. I care about, about firing them up, about enthusing them. I don't care. My ego doesn't need people to say, oh my God, you're an amazing speaker anymore. It did when I was younger. Don't get me wrong. I needed that. And that's the difference. Even with charging, I have that confidence in knowing that what I charge 
is of value. And if you work with me, you get value for money. You know, all the stuff that I'd figured out years and years ago is exactly what I'm talking about now, Jenny. The only difference is now I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to um, touch on quickly, um, what keeps driving you to write? Um, you know, uh-huh. we've, we've mentioned 14 books and, you know, over a, obviously an extended period, but, you know, um, and, and certainly when I look down your catalogue, <clears throat> um, you know, there's some, there's some pearly, pearly titles in there. Um, but, you know, what keeps driving you to write? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think that once you become a writer, you, 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 you write, mm. you know, like I, I, I'm always working on my next book. It's, it's, there's always another, you know, pile of books that, that I, that I want to write. And I, to be honest, I just can't imagine not having a book that I'm working <laughs> on. Now, when I say I'm working on it, it could just be up here and it's just yeah. working on it is it's percolating, but I reach a point and it's there, but it's also, it's, look, I'm a commercial writer. I, I write to make money. It's a part yeah. of my business model. Yeah. And so it's just, it, it's built into what I do now. That sounds very mercenary and considered. Don't get me wrong. I love books. I love writing and I'm very passionate about it, but I also have a very eyes wide open approach to it. You yeah. know, and, and I, and I, as I say, I write commercially, but I also, I really write, I hope to, to address um, what the issues are at the moment, mm. you know, and to give people that confidence around doing things, whether it was a simple book about how to market your business you know, mm. back when I met so many people that were struggling with that and still do, you know, right through to people not charging enough. Mm. You know, my, mm. my, my next book is going to be 27 ways that your small business can save the planet, you know. Wow. And, and you know, that's just feels like the right book, you know, to all 27 ways your small business can make this, the world a better planet, you know, something like that. But, yeah. but because that's what feels that's the book that I need to write now, you know? Yeah. So. Well, I, I, I'm looking forward to the next one because this, this current one's an absolute joy. <laughs> so. yeah, thank you. Thank you for being such a fan and an advocate. I, I really appreciate it. Oh no, it's, it's, well, it's kind of quite selfish really, because <laughs> I, I do, I do feel like, you know, I mean, and, and as business owners and particularly in a creative space and, and particularly working with, you know, um, businesses, you know, you can, conf- you can forget yourself, you know, you're so, so focused on, on everyone else. And so, um, you know, I, I find that whatever I learn um, from the work that you do, it, it builds me. And if I'm better, then I'm better for the people that I am there to help. So it's that exactly. ripple effect. And mm. I, so, you know, the, the food chain's got to start somewhere, Andrew. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love, and that is a big thing. There is nothing better, like for me as an author, to have someone, you know, like yourself, Jenny, saying, oh, my God, I loved your book. You know, it's like it's like an artist who's done a painting, who, yeah. who, who someone has loves it. But, you know, I, I get these emails from people like over the years, you know, like uh, it's they blow you. I got a message from a lady on the weekend saying you saved my marriage. Yeah, you know, my husband was, you know, seven days a week, twelve hours a day, working himself to death, making no money. We've doubled his prices. He lost half of his customers, but working half as long, making exactly the same amount, same of, money. amount of money. And all yeah. of a sudden, he's home for yeah. dinner. He's smiling again. He's yeah. happy. He's, you know, he, he's, he's, he's talking about, let's go away for a weekend. We haven't done that for 15 years, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that is very, very common to hear that yeah. stuff. And I, mean, I go, that's what breaks my heart to get a message like that. You know, I, I got another email a while back from a couple in Bali. They said, hi, Andrew, you don't know who we are. Um, we bought every one of your books over the last 20 years. We do every single thing that you say. We just sold our business for $30 million and that's a hundred percent because of you and, wow. uh, and it was like you know wow and and then i'll get an email from a a kid in singapore who's 10 who, who who's read one of my books and has decided they're going to be an entrepreneur because they've read someone's got to be the mate they started a business you know d- collecting stuff off of all their friends and doing a weekly garage sale which they're then you know taking a percentage of the the, the thing so it's like 
there's you know there's many things you get back yeah. when you write books and at the end of the day you know I had a lady who was going to commit suicide who oh. rang me one afternoon in my office and I happened to be there and just because she had a copy of one of my books and she opened it up and saw my number and related to me in the book and we we ended up talking for hours and hours like you know I wrote a book about marketing for god's sake <laughs> You know, like the, the things that have evolved from it are just extraordinary. So. Yeah. Well, that means that it's a true gift and that's, you know, that's what Thank we're you. here for after all. So yeah, I am very excited to see what's next for you. And I'm very interested to hear um, about the, the, the next book idea. <laughs> One day I will find time to come and do some of your training courses, your speakers training and your uh, author Academy. Although I think I did say to you in an email, one day that I, I might be the the uh, the student in your author's class that literally blows you up because <laughs> I have too many ideas in my yeah, head. That's good though. That's good. I like it when someone comes. Um, it's one or the other. I, yeah. got, I want to write a book. I've got no idea what it's about or it's I've got a thousand ideas. Where do I start? Now, I can't cannot let you go without getting you to share some hidden gems. After all, we are on the Genesis Gems podcast. I want you to think about, you know, if I if if you're an advice business, you're looking to level up and find confidence in your own space. What are some of the hidden gems that you think they should be considering? Mm. It can I, be I, one, by the way. It doesn't yeah, have to be. Yeah, sure. No, look, there's a couple of things that I would say straight off the cuff. Um, the first thing is 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 you got to get really really good at explaining how you're different not how you're the same. And, and 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 I see so many businesses now that are just, they, they don't differentiate. And, you know, advice, accounts, lawyers, mortgage brokers, you go to most websites, they're pretty much exactly the same. The, the, the marketing rule, you know, 101 is get really good at differentiating yourself. Mm. Not mm. Don't tell people how you're exactly the same. Like mm. I guarantee if I go to most financial advisory sites on the front page, the word trusted is going to be in the first sentence. And there's going to be a photo of two grandparents with a small grandchild on a beach in a park <laughs> or on a swing. Right now, you, that's just the reality of it. And, and why? Because the financial advisor says, build me a website like that guys. Yeah. So we just, you know, it's like we, we build the same, be different, embrace your different, tell great stories, tell your stories, tell your mm. evolution story, why you do that's the biggest thing that can differentiate you is why you do what you do. Mm. Let people into your business. And I think if you if you do that really well, then that's that's a, a big differentiator. Mm. Um, the third thing is now more than ever is that we are a testimonial-based business. And uh, and I don't know how the laws and things go with advisors around that. Um, you know, I know some industries, you know, you're not allowed to use testimonials as like, you know, medical and so forth. Um but, but the stories, the case studies, you know, because I'll believe what Bill says about you more than I'm yeah. going to believe what you say about you. That's just where we're at now. How many Google reviews do you have? What what other people say? I have thousands of testimonials and mm. I use them, right? Mm. Because they are the credibility tools, you know, that we, that we have there, you know, mm. so much. So, I mean, look, I, I could rattle on a lot of gems, um, but I, I think... The, the last one I would say is, is is that you've got to be passionate and energetic about your business. You know, you know, if you're not excited about your business, and I know that's tough at times. I, mm. I get it. You know, like particularly when it's gone through a lot of change and upheaval in the industry. But if you're not passionate and excited about your business, you can't expect anyone else to be. Mm. Um, and there's a wonderful Chinese proverb that I I love to quote. It's in the back of the book, and it says. Man without a smiling face should never open a shop. <laughs> and uh, and and I always Brilliant. say to myself, why do so many miserable bastards seem to open shops? Now <laughs> you get the shop as a metaphor, but but people would people want to buy from people they like. Yes, and, and, and we want to do business with people who we enjoy and who we can trust. So you know, have some fun in your business. You know, lighten up. It is only business, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, like, and and I know all that that contains, but I tell you, my business is far more successful when I'm passionate, when I'm energetic, when I'm playful, when I'm having fun, when I'm different, when I'm, you know, when my wonderful clients are, are, are promoting me and selling me to the point where 
I really don't need to do a whole lot of marketing because yeah. they do it for me. And, and I think everyone listening to this, you can do the same thing. You've got a, a lot of upheaval. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but you've got to look at that as an opportunity. You know, if, you know, considered evolution, now is the time to change everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can get away with doing that. Reinvigorate it. Make a business to suit you. If you only want to be open four days a week, be open four days a week. Yeah, you know, that's it. That's you know, it. Build it to suit you, not anyone else. And, yeah. And, and that will keep you energized. I, I I think that that energy and passion piece. I feel like you know when the life has been sucked out of an industry and it's it's finding its feet again. I feel like it's probably one of the best gems that I've heard. Um, but I I cannot thank you enough. Oh, um, you're I've so thoroughly welcome. enjoyed this conversation. I always do enjoy my conversations with you, but I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing you on a stage near me real soon. <laughs> Sometime soon, undoubtedly. Thank you, Sometime Jenny. soon. Um, I um I have just subscribed to your YouTube channel, which I didn't even realize you had. And I've just seen some really cool videos that I can watch. So it, it's just had a bit to- of a revamp. I'm gonna do a weekly video on there now talking about kind of current issues and things like that as well. So there's not a lot on there at the moment, but it's gonna um, get a, a facelift uh, there's, soon. there's enough bite-sized chunks to keep this girl busy <laughs> <laughs> and this book you know someone has to be the most expensive why not make it you i i cannot recommend it highly enough as i said i'm i'm you know uh, i'm just about to read chapter 33 which you know i, I think is a really good sign that is a know, good sign um which is about being the best i i believe i think okay. i just that's where I'm up to. It's the perfect time to be the best. So okay. I got think a, you, that's you got a bit of reading to do, haven't you? I have. I'm, I I did try. I did try to get through it all. But it, the, the trouble is that I was enjoying things so much that I kept going back and rereading bits. <laughs> so I'm not one to read all the way to the end. I like to, oh, oh, oh I've got to read so, back to that bit again. So <laughs> I love but, it. I do thank you so much for your time and for all that you have um, imparted in our conversation. And I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thank Thanks you, so much, Jenny. Andrew. And thank you to your lovely listeners as well. So I hope we've uh, we've added some value into their world. And and it is it's a challenging time, climate change, but you know, look for the opportunity. Hundred percent, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Thanks for joining us today on Financial Marketing Secrets. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and be sure to follow me, Jenny Pierce, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, wherever you enjoy joining the conversation. Can't wait to connect with you. I'm looking forward to sharing some more Genesis Gems with you in the next session of Financial Marketing Secrets. See you then.